are going to talk today all about lightning. <laughs> Ciao. Sorry, I had to throw that in there. But um, really, we're talking more about this sort of lightning. Um, obviously, the lightning that comes from the sky, it's a very common uh, meteorological hazard uh, in Canada. Um, it is very dangerous. Um, each year in Canada, we have nine to 10 deaths from that, 164 injuries. You can see those numbers. I, I mean, some of the injuries are, are crazy. Um, you, I've heard about stories about people um, doing dishes in the house. Like, if, if, if there's a lightning storm, don't do the dishes because your hands are in the water, lightning comes down, hits the house. People have been electrocuted that way. It really is crazy, uh, dangerous uh, to, do, uh, to do that and obviously to be outside in lightning. Also causes 4,000 plus forest fires. That's in the, the whole of Canada. And I was at a talk recently where they mentioned the cost involved in evacuating people from a hospital in the case of a forest fire. And that ran into millions. And that was just like one hospital, one forest fire. So you can imagine these many fires going on every year, just, uh, just at the impact that it costs, the economic impact. And in the province of Manitoba, which is there where I live, we had five to 600 power outages. Um, I think that was last year with <coughs> because of lightning. So, I mean, obviously that's, that's nearly two a day, two, two outages a day, and uh, they'd like to, uh, that, so it's obviously causing that economic impact as well as just the, uh, the danger itself. Uh, I just wanted to play a quick video as well, um, just to show you the, uh, the impact it has. I found this video on YouTube uh, a couple of days ago. Hopefully it'll uh, appear on screen here. No, it's appearing on my screen, but um, I don't know if I can get it to appear on yours. So um, maybe we will skip that. Unless it, oh no, here we go. And we'll skip that ad, because you don't need to know that. So this is some guy standing next to his car. Uh, in the middle of a desert, it's, or wherever it is, it's raining, it's a rainbow, and um, he's sort of filming it because it's really quite a nice. Um, and then, bang. <laughs> and the cloud of smoke, oh, it's just so... That's what it's like to be struck by lightning. Um, I, it's not something you really want to uh, happen to you, I guess. And the... Um, the result, well, you get these big, like, scorch marks. So if, if it's melting tarmac, then you know it's pretty hot. So lightning is a very dangerous uh, thing to occur. So let's, um, so I just wanted to show that because I, I was stunned when I, I saw quite, uh, like, how fast a guy was filming, and then the next second he's on his back looking up in the sky. It was just incredible. And lightning is also very, very frequent as well. I mean, I don't know if you realize quite how frequent it actually is. So we, in Canada alone, we get 2.34 million strikes a year. Um, and most of that is concentrated in the uh, sort of prairie belt, southern Manitoba, uh, out further east towards uh, Ontario. And during the summer months, they get one strike every three seconds on average in Canada. And because it's concentrated in that one particular belt, um, quite often you get it more than that. I, I, I stood outside of my house the other night and there was a lightning storm going off in the distance. And I, I could see the lightning, but I couldn't hear it. So I was counting it and um, I counted 57 strikes in one minute. It was just like that going continuously. So lightning is very, very frequent and obviously uh, very dangerous as well. So, Obviously, the Weather Network, they, they wanted to come up with some way to help uh, provide information for the public to make sure they weren't caught out in lightning storms and they weren't surprised by it. And so what they wanted to do was set up a system where you could get public alerts, you could get it via the website, um, also uh, direct messaging to your uh, phone or to email, mobile applications on your phone as well, and then they could put that information out on the TV. Well, so they wanted to get that information out to the public to try and safeguard them and try and prevent some of those injuries and loss of lives that we, uh, we just saw about. And they also wanted to put things like dynamic maps and interactive tools on there as well. So um, interactive tools, you can click, when you click a button when you see the lightning, click again when you hear the thunder, and it counts how far away it is. And, uh, uh, so you get an idea of the distance of the lightning. 
And so a, a project of that type, really you're looking at something like a notification system. And this is sort of a non-spatial thing. So something happens, you get a notification about it, and that notification is acted upon and sent to somebody who carries out some action. Um, so that's just sort of a standard thing. If you're throwing GIS and spatial into the mix, then obviously we've got this sort of spatial system. Quite often it'll be a geofence that we're using, injecting into that event and notification process to, uh, to do something with the data. So geofence, well, okay, you probably know it's just like a virtual area of interest. You sort of draw an area on the map and you say, that's my fence and um, that's the area I'm interested in. But you can be interested in various ways. You can say, well, am I actually in that area? Am I close to that area? Am I driving along and I'm going to go through that area? So there's all these different uh, spatial relationships that can go on uh, between um, a geofence and the event that's going on. And I'm not just talking about lightning here. I'm talking about any sort of system where an event happens. It happens at a certain place. And you can monitor where that's occurred uh, and how it is in relationship to other features like are they together, are they close, are they far? Any of the spatial relationships you can think of, you can apply in that sense. And FME I'll mention is obviously, uh, well obviously I think is very good at, um, at doing this. So to go to the lightning example in particular, this is what a lightning detector looks like in case you were, you were ever wondering about that. So now you can rest easy, you know what a lightning detector looks like. Um, just a quick point of interest, it uh, works by radio receiver and it says on here, oh, I've got, I got a laser, I've got to use a laser. Just there it says TOA, and that's time of arrival. So what happens is you get the lightning strike, and it goes bang, and it sets off radio waves. And this is basically a radio receiver, and it times the arrival of those radio waves at that particular point. Um, and in fact, the very first radio receiver ever, some more uh, trivia here, the first radio receiver ever was designed to monitor lightning strikes, like in the... 1800s or whatever. Um, obviously they didn't come up with radio and start broadcasting music and the first um, receiver was actually to monitor uh, lightning strikes. So they have a network of uh, these um, um, detection systems all over Canada, a few down in the, um, the US. You notice there aren't that many up in the north of Canada, sort of that area up there. And that's again that's because most of the lightning occurs in this sort of band sort of southern Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and all the way across to uh, Ontario. And this bit around Ontario, I'm, I'm told, is particularly prone to uh, lightning strikes. So they have this system of, of um, detectors. When a lightning strike occurs, you've got the time of arrival. So you measure the time of arrival of those radio waves at each station. And from that, you can figure out, well, what the difference in time was. And therefore, you can figure out what the uh, location of that lightning strike was. So that's how a lightning detection system works. So to get the system set up and uh, FME to start issuing these alerts, um, we have these different uh, components that they wanted to include. So you've got the detectors themselves, you've got FME, we've got uh, Postgres database, and then an, an Apache active message queue for dealing with the messages that are going out. So basically, You've got FME running, it's listening for a lightning strike, and that information is being sent from the receiver over a TCP IP connection. As soon as that information comes in, FME picks it up, processes it, and writes it out to Postgres so they've got a record of it, because it's really important to keep a record of, uh, of all the strikes that they've got for historical reasons and for a few processing reasons we'll look at in a second. So then they do some spatial processing, which is the sort of predicate things I was talking about. This is where they inject the GIS part into the notification setup. So they say, well, OK, where was that lightning strike? And they've got the whole country sort of divided up into separate uh, little areas. And they pick out which area that lightning strike fell in. And then they've got a bit of other logic as well, which is why they write it to Postgres, because they say, well, one lightning strike isn't really an event. It's just like something, one lightning strike, it could just be like a one-off. But as soon as you get two strikes in the same area within a five minute period, that's when they officially call it a lightning event and start to pass out that information. 
So that's why it's important we write that information to PostGIS. Because when a lightning strike comes in, FME says, OK, well, is there a current event? OK, if there's not, has there been a lightning strike in the last five minutes in this zone? If there is, well, this is the second. OK, I'm calling an event now and sending messages out. So that's how the, uh, the logic works with that. And so that FME then customizes a JSON message and it uh, sends it out um, through the active message queue off to whichever systems uh, need to uh, respond to that information. And uh, yeah, dispatches it via uh, JMS. So this is a little uh, a map, it's sort of an internal system they've got and it shows you some of the boundaries. Um, you can see there's this uh, boundary here, so I'm guessing that's one of the areas that is covered and then you have another area, that one in blue, which sort of overlaps as well. And I'm guessing it overlaps because if, you, if you're like, say this line here is the boundary between the two zones, I don't want to be stood here and then lightning goes off like two feet away from me, but I'm not in the same zone, so it doesn't count. Like that, that'd be pretty strange. So I'm guessing that's why they have the overlap between the two different zones. So if a lightning strike occurs there, it's in, it's in both zones at the same time. And so you can see in this example, they started, they got the first strike, or the event started at 16.50. Um, they've had a 23 lightning strikes since then. And the last one they had was at um, 18 minutes past five, a little bit later. So you've got, what's that, about 28 minutes and 23 lightning strikes, which is probably fairly sedate uh, as, as compared to some uh, storms that you get. So there's a lot of transformers that go into this. Um, the key ones are the TCP IP receiver, which is what listens to the open TCP IP port and waits for an incoming message from the lightning detector to say that the strike has occurred. And then we have the point and area overlay, which takes the location of that lightning strike and it overlays it against all those area polygons that we've got and says, well, okay, which zones does this point fall in? And then you've got the tester. The tester's doing the, um, the other logic, like is it the second one, is it within five minutes, that sort of thing. So we've got the tester doing the, the non-spatial logic. And if it's not the tester, it'll be something similar, like test filter or a, a transformer like that. And then the two things that set the message up, well, the JSON template sets it up. So what they have is a standard message in JSON format that they read into FME, and then they just plug in the information. So they say, um, you've got a standard message like the event started at X, this is lightning strike number Y, and the last strike was at Z. And so then they plug those X, Y, Z numbers into it to construct that message with the JSON templater. And then the JMS sender is a transformer that connects to an active message queue or other sort of JMS messaging system and sends that uh, message out to whoever needs to take action on it. So that's how it's pretty much set up in FME um, and the general structure of things. Um, I'll just mention it was, um, so I'll, I'll just go back to that. It was set up on FME server. It's not running on just desktop. It's actually a server that's running this. And how they did it was with one, just one server engine. And what they've done is we, well, we helped them develop uh, we developed for them this uh, transformer, this TCP IP receiver transformer. And when you put that in a workspace and run it, the workspace holds at that transformer and it waits for incoming features. It doesn't just like run through it and say, okay, no data, let's finish the workspace. It continues to run continuously until it gets a feature in. And then it sends that feature out onto the rest of the transformers. So it's one engine on server, but it's continuously running 24-7, um, waiting for lightning strikes. So some of the challenges, well, the biggest challenge was this high volume of real-time data. And I think Don mentioned this yesterday. They bench tested it in this event they called Stormageddon. And they threw as many features that they could at it. And it, they went up to like 50,000 strikes a second. and still couldn't uh, get FME to fall over and they couldn't generate strikes faster than that. So um, they figured that, well, it must be working okay. So um, I'm not sure if we actually, I, I'll, I'll be honest and say, I'm not sure if we processed all 50,000 in under a second, but we certainly handled that incoming data and didn't fall over. So that was the important thing, that we wouldn't lose 
data because because um, we were stuck doing something else. So we're handling that uh, that amount of uh, volume. Fifty thousand. Okay, that's. Um, a little extreme, but in, in extreme cases, it can get up to like 10,000 a second. When you think how big a country Canada is, like obviously it's huge. I mean, if you've flown here, say from Europe, you sort of come over the coast of Canada and you think, oh great, well you must be nearly there. And then five hours later, you might hit Vancouver. So, I mean, it's, it is a one big country. And if you think lightning strikes and storms are going on all over the place, like even now there's like one, two, three, lightning strikes probably occurring somewhere. And so in really extreme events, yeah, they tell me you can get up to 10,000 strikes in any one second. So um, obviously not continuously, but you've got, to be, you've got to be able to handle the, the, the high volume burst of data. Cross-platform development, because they wanted to get it on your mobile system. So they wanted to get it on Apple, on Android, and any other phones uh, that they could uh, do that on. Short time frame as well, and I think for me this is one of the things I really love about FME Server is that you can implement these sort of things so quickly. Um, really, the, the key transformers in this, there were like five transformers, and once you've got that, I mean, what's it going to take to set a workspace up to do that? Probably half an hour. If you have to really think about it, maybe a couple of hours, but um, it's, it wouldn't take too long to set up a system like that. If, once you've got the detection in place, it's sending FME the data, it's not much for FME to handle that information. And I love, like we've got a, um, a talk going on across the hallway now about rapid prototype, rapid development with FME. And this is what I really love about server is the fact that you can do these things so quickly. Um, like I got, I, we've got the app on the phone. I, just, I go off on a bit of a tangent, but we've got an FME app on the phones you can use that um, does, that ties into an FME server and within half an hour of work, I can use that app, I can use FME server and desktop and create a vehicle tracking system because I did it not, not long ago. Um, I went on a business trip and set the system up so my wife would know where I was at any one time. And yeah, it took about half an hour to do. So I mean, six months, that's, that gives them plenty of time to polish that system up. They've obviously got to get the website uh, set up as well. And they had, they eventually created these internal testing tools as well. So again, you can see these different areas uh, of interest that are probably around a particular town in a particular area. And they can go into this sort of system like a QA setup and they can test uh, and, and click on that and say, well, okay, there's been eight, stro eight lightning strikes and whatever. And, um, and just make sure that FME is actually keeping up with the uh, system and doing the right thing. So out of this, they get a whole bunch of different products. Because uh, once you've got sent that message off to wherever, I mean, you can do whatever you want with it. So, so OK, I mean, you've got their website. So you've got, it says here, lightning strike alert. Um, this is the interactive distance calculator where you can press the key and it'll tell you how far away the lightning is. Um, OK, th this one right at the top, this is a screenshot I took. This, is, this was great because they implemented this system and it was going live and um, and, of, uh, and right up to that point we had lightning storms every single day of the summer I think and as soon as that went live they stopped and I'm sitting in my house come on I want I want some lightning strikes I need these strikes and um, then at like at I don't know 10 50 in the evening suddenly the I'm lying in bed and the lightning flashes outside and I jump to my feet and like where's my phone where's my phone and turned the phone on and took the screenshot because I just wanted to see it uh, live and in action. So, um, and that, that was the other reason, by the way, that they had a short development period was because they decided to start this project right in the uh, beginning of the year, like I don't know in January or something, and the key um, lightning period in Canada is June and July. So they wanted to get it ready for that uh, summer uh, events to occur. So they had to have a, a pretty rapid uh, development uh, process. And then they've got the mobile products as well. You can get this on your phone, and you can see um, when there's a thunderstorm warning, it'll tell you on your phone. And you can see the little lightning symbols. And these symbols all seem to be the same, but I've seen other ones since where you've got the little cloud and multiple strikes coming out. So I'm wondering if they've got a sort of symbology that denotes different uh, amounts of lightning according to the symbol that you see. So, so anyway, it's on the mobile. I'm sure, I know it's on the iPhone. Um, probably on Android as well. 
And then in the future, hopefully they're gonna get some more dynamic maps out there. Because at the moment, the lightning strikes are just sort of sharing a map with general weather. They, they don't have a, a specific lightning uh, map right now. So they're gonna do that uh, pretty soon. And then they're probably gonna extend it all to all of the phone platforms that they can. Um, user selectable warnings and push notifications. What that means is they've got Java, they've got this Java message system and basically you can get JavaScript out, JSON or XML. They've created an XML feed as well. So basically they'll be able to create customers, uh, they will allow customers to create their own customized geofence. So the customer can say, okay, well, I'm, I'm in Vancouver, I, I've got the, uh, what do they call the hockey place here, the Rogers Arena. So say I'm at the Rogers Arena and um, I want to know if there's lightning that comes within like three or four miles of there. So the lightning, the weather network could put a, a geofence around them and say, okay, well, we'll let you know when lightning strikes occur within that area. And they've got an XML feed as well. So as a customer, you can just receive that feed and do what you like with the data and uh, process it however you want. So, uh, so that's uh, pretty much it. Um, yeah, I think, it, I think it's important. I'm just going back to this because we only ever had one engine running. I just want to emphasize that because that really to me is the amazing thing. You've got FME server, you've got one engine running. The sales team would have loved to have sold them 50,000 engines, but it didn't happen. It's just the one engine continuously running, continually listening for lightning strikes to occur and then processing that. So it's a very uh, fast, very reactive system um, and it handles a lot of data out there and it was developed um, pretty rapidly, I'd say. So how are we doing for time, Brian? We done? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so if you've got any questions about that, you can, uh, well, ask me some questions now, but if you need to know more about the Lightning system and if uh, you want to find out more about the data, um, ping an email off to Fiona. She will uh, be able to help you out with information about that. Good. Thank you very much, Mark. Oh, you're welcome. So if anyone has any questions, I can come by with the mic. Hey, Mark, uh, in your uh, overall architecture, I noticed uh -huh. you have uh, Apache Active MQ. Yes. And post post just in, in the process. Uh, it seems seem to me if we use uh, FME server, mm -hmm. it has a notification and system, so we can simply, we don't really need Active MQ, right? Um, in this case. That's true. Notification system does include uh, a messaging queue. So yes, they could have probably not done that, but the thing about that is that we're only running one engine and we're running it continuously, so we don't want to be issuing notifications from server like that um, because I think it would slow things down a little bit. It's quicker for us to um, just send that information out using the JMS sender rather than run it as a notification setup. Okay. So that, that will be why, I think. Okay. Any other questions? I can ask a quick one, Mark. For sure, yeah. This process, could it be run on FME Cloud? Um, yeah, I don't see why not. I mean, it's just one, again, it's just one engine running, and um, it's not, I mean, the TCP IP should be okay as long as the port's open, and um, yeah, so I, I don't see why not. I don't think they do that. I think they, they want to use their own setup, or, well, an FME Cloud wasn't really available when they did this anyway, but yeah, there's no, I don't think there's any technical reason why you couldn't do that. Oh, wow. oh, okay. Oh, excellent. Excellent. So this, this is one of our FME Cloud developers here. So, uh, yeah. we can, uh, Great. So. If there's no further questions, I'd like okay. to thank Mark well, very thanks much. Thanks, folks.